Hi, this is Jim Janesey, and I'm just uh, making this little video to introduce you to the lecture, lecture number seven, which occurred on January 25th, 2011. Now, this lecture deals with the uh, finish up of the topic we started last week, which was the evolution of computers from the earliest days on forward. Uh, that discussion last week took us up to cloud computing, a little mention of what might be coming down the pike. But the topic that I didn't get into at that point was supercomputers and scientific applications of computers, including things like weather prediction and uh, geoprocessing. So this lecture, uh, which is about one hour long, covers that topic, and it deals with uh, pages from the writings that are being made available in the workbook. So I hope you enjoyed this lecture. The uh, rest of this is actually just the slides that were presented in class and my voice narrating them. So this is the last you'll see of my smiling face in this uh, presentation. I put up this slide just to um, announce what it is we're going to be talking about today. In the, the last lecture, which I did put up on the web, by the way, uh, I extract from what, I, what gets captured here, and I put it up as a lecture. And I think maybe I'll just show you what that looks like before we go too much farther so that you can see how things have evolved. So the reason I'm saying that, part of the reason is the people who tune into this thing over the internet wanted to see what was available now and how these will continue to be available. Okay, if you go here, down in this lower left corner, these will flesh out as we conduct these lectures and they will look something like this. The IT ROI and now what you're looking at, of course, is part of the screen that is captured by that video camera in the room. Here, I left my little face down here and the slide up like this. That lecture from last Tuesday actually covered the earlier subjects in this unit, which is a little bit of history of computers through the decades and the different types of computers, leading cloud computing, which is kind of a modern phenomenon. Well, today what we're going to do is to pick up where that left off. There's one other type of computer that I wanted to talk about that isn't included in that earlier group, and it's supercomputers. And supercomputers have a very specific reason for being. These kinds of machines are not business data processing machines, and these still tend to be one-of-a-kind creations. Now, supercomputers early on in the computing era tended to be machines that had a more powerful processor, so the processor ran faster and the machine had much more memory provided to it because it was intended to do huge amounts of computations very quickly. The kind of work that these machines do is scientific. And one example I can give you of that is weather prediction. To predict weather with mathematical models, the atmosphere is cut up into cells. If you think about the atmosphere, the weather part of the atmosphere is maybe uh, seven miles deep. 35 to 40,000 feet, that's where the clouds are, and that's where the weather occurs. So if you took the atmosphere of the Earth over some large area of the country, and you cut it up into cubes one mile on the side, you could figure out what's going on inside that cube with the air, that is the density of the air, the temperature, the way the wind happens to be blowing right now, and the composition of it, if there's particles in it or if it's cloudy, and what's happening on the ground with the temperature, and Mathematical formulas can be developed and have been developed to predict how this thing would interact inside and with its neighbors. Well, there's a lot of those one square mile cubes if you took the atmosphere over a large area and they interact with each other. So if you started with some weather event occurring in one place and you did these calculations, then you could see what the effect was on all sides of that cube and then you'd have to redo the calculations for all the things surrounding it and then surrounding that, surrounding that, and the interactions between them. So it's a huge amount of calculations to see what will happen with the mathematical model of the weather. Well, it doesn't make much sense to predict tomorrow's weather and take three days doing it. There's nobody's interested in Thursday's prediction if it comes about as late as Sunday. Then it's just history already. So in order to do this rapidly, you need to be able to crunch a lot of numbers fast. So that's where supercomputers like this originated, they still tend to be big machines. An earlier model of one here 
built by a company called Cray in the 1970s was kind of an interesting thing. They built it in a circular pattern like this, and this was actually a bench, not that anybody would sit on it. But the reason they did it this way is they wanted the circuitry to be close, physically close, so that they minimized the time the signals would go from one part to another. Because they were really trying with one processor to ramp it up and make it run as fast as possible to grind a lot of numbers. Well, another approach taken nowadays, since computing chips have, have been miniaturized to such an extent and made in mass production, is to put more CPUs, that is more processing units, maybe 10,000 processing units in one computer. And the kind of processing that this is good for is called parallel processing. What that means is the thing that you're trying to do can be separated into separate tests. And here's an example for you. Supposing you wanted to pave a road, and the road was 10 miles long, and for some reason you had to get it done very fast. Ordinarily, you might give the contract to one paving company, and they'd start at one end, and they'd start paving it. But you want to get it done real fast, so you give out 10 contracts each to a different company for one mile of road, and they all start working at the same time. Then the road gets done 10 times as fast. And it works because they're not interfering with one another. The only thing you have to worry about is where one company's work ends and the next one begins. It ought to be at the same level and be rather smooth. But that's pretty easy to, uh, to work out. So by putting more people onto that kind of a job, you can get the work done faster. And that's parallel processing. It's happening in parallel all at the same time. Now, there's another term in computers called concurrent processing that is also defined in this little write-up. And concurrent processing and parallel processing are different. <coughs> concurrent processing is what happens in a computer like this where it looks like I actually have several things going on at one time. Like I'm reading this document, so Adobe Acrobat is here, and I'm also looking at YouTube, and I've got my documents open, and I might have many things going on down here. And if I click on any one of them, it's running. So I might get the idea that all of these are running at once, but it's not really true. What's happening is even if these things were both doing things, like I had YouTube playing a video, and I was at the, at the, other, at the same moment, I was just listening to that. I wasn't even viewing it. And here I was scrolling through a document. I might think that both things are happening at once, but it's not true. What's happening is the computer is spreading its time around in tiny, tiny little increments of time, millions of a second even, more likely thousands of a second. Now that seems like such a small amount of time that not much can get done. But in fact, this thing operates at millions of instructions a second, maybe a billion instructions a second. So a thousandth of a second, it can get a lot of work done. So it's, it keeps spreading its, its resources around, kind of like round robin. It's putting a little time here, a little time here, a little time here, a little time here. In fact, it's pretty common that if you think about what's happening with the keyboard, the machine is having to receive keystrokes and do things with it. Well, what is the time interval between me typing and striking one key and striking the next key? I think it's very short. But even in that small amount of time, the machine can do thousands of instructions. So machines are set up to do that. They, they do concurrent processing because they operate so fast. And this is all the way back to the days of the mainframe. Even those batch machines, they could do 10 jobs at once. You think 10 jobs are running. But it's only because the machine is giving some attention here and then either at a predetermined time or when this program requests something to be done that could be done by some other processor, like reading a tape, this switches its attention to something else and is productive there. So this kind of, this kind of concurrent processing, most computers do that. Most operating systems are set up to do that now. But parallel processing is different than that. And it's for an entirely different purpose. Now, parallel processing isn't widely used in business because it turns out that most of the things we do, you can't cut up in the same way. So here's an example of a task you couldn't cut up. Supposing this zoo has a breeding pair of elephants. They are a male and a female. And they want to have a baby elephant as rapidly as possible. So they have this breeding pair. That's one female and one male. But they're going to put three females out of the job. And they're going to get it done in one third of the time, right? So normally it takes an elephant 22 months to have a baby. Not nine months like a human, but 22 months, long gestation period. So by putting three females onto it, they can get the baby in seven months, right? No. You 
can't fault it. You, you can't parallel process on that. It, everything has to be done in sequence, and of course it's going to be done with one female. So I don't care how many elephants you put onto it, you're still going to get the baby elephant in 22 months, if you're lucky. So some tasks can't be cut up in the same way. And some accounting tasks can't be cut up in the same way either. If you think about it, if you're doing all sorts of processing on balancing some books and transactions here have to be added up and then subtotals added into other totals and other totals, you can't do those sub add up the subtotals until you have them. So they gotta be done in sequence. So the business of doing parallel processing is complicated. And it's only done in instances where this kind of mathematical modeling needs to be done and you can break the task up in that way. Now you could do weather modeling that way because disconnected cells far enough apart you could be doing multiple things at the same time or you can break the calculations up. And there are only a few supercomputers in the world. What I picture here, this one is at Oak Ridge. It's just a bunch of room full of cabinets. It's not really very interesting in that way. This one's in China and it currently has the record for the fastest uh, supercomputer in the world. It's like it's like trillions and trillions of operations a second it can do because it has 11,000 processors in it. That's 11,000 CPUs and a lot of complicated programming to split work up and then get it all back together again. So these things are very specialized and they're not things that you're likely to run across uh, in terms of uh, any kind of a career that you might uh, you might build on unless you were very highly mathematical or into physics. Uh, nuclear explosion modeling is done exactly the same way and various kinds of construction, you know, analyzing the stresses in the building are done sometimes for large projects in this way, although smaller computers can handle that. So that's the last type of computer we'll talk about just so that you understand those definitions. Now, I'm going to show you something that leads right into the next subject. When we talk about doing work on a computer, we have to map the work out in what's called an algorithm. And an algorithm, I'm going to show you a definition of it here by tuning into the website once again. And you notice I keep going through this screen because I can type in c4e.us a whole lot faster than any other words. So if I go here, now what I wanted to do was to go to this one. And here I set up a video in kind of a different way. There are two videos here, but there's this prefacing explanation first. So the videos are down here, but I wanted to show you this stuff first. Now eventually, I'll just put this into a printed page too, but it's kind of nice that it's right here where the videos are. What you're going to want to look at is this. In order for a computer program to be written of any type, the work that it has to do has to be cast into the form of an algorithm. And here's the definition. It's an ordered set of unambiguous executable steps defining a terminating process. Now that really is a mouthful. Here's what it means. You have a step-by-step -step set of instructions that's very clear. That's what unambiguous means. There's no question about this. There's no maybe in here. You, know, you can make decisions, but it's clearly specified what decisions you're making. And everything that you're laying out, it's possible to do. The steps are executable. And it defines a terminating process. So let me give you an example first that has nothing to do with computers. Supposing that wall was to be painted. In order to do that, you were going to tell somebody who really has never painted a wall before, and they're not necessarily very swift. They're, they're not good at using their judgment. They don't have much judgment, but they have a very great memory, and they can certainly read your instructions, and you're going to tell them how to go about painting that wall. So what's going to happen? you're going to have to tell them what they're going to have to do to get started. Well, they're going to have to get some paint. They're going to have to get a ladder. They're going to have to get a roller, probably. And let's assume the wall is already prepared. Somebody's washed it and you know it's been taped off and everything else. What are they going to do? And let's just suppose that the wall isn't very tall, and they are, and they can do the entire stripe from the ceiling down to the floor. So you might tell them, Okay, go to the left side of the wall, dip the roller in the paint, fly it to the wall and roll it on down and up and down and up so you get a stripe on the wall. Then move over and repeat the process. Dip the roller in the paint, go up there, roll it on up and down, 
three times, that over and do it again. So you're repeating these steps. But eventually, they're going to hit the end of the wall. So you're going to have to put in something in here that is a little test that will end this process. It's a, it's a question they're going to have to ask every time because remember, we can't take anything for granted. I mean, they, they're just going to keep trying to go. And they're, they're going to get stuck. It's like a little machine. They're going to get stuck bouncing against the next wall if you don't tell them what it, it takes to stop. So what you're going to have to do is build in a little question. And the little question has to come before they take an action. So the question is this. If there's more room on the wall, move over and then repeat the process. Now that's the first thing that happens in this repeatable sequence. So the next thing, the stripe has been painted, they ask the question, is there more space on the wall? There is. Okay, repeat the process. Is there more space on the wall? Yes, it is. Repeat the process. Eventually, that question comes up answered differently. Is there more space on the wall? No. Then don't repeat the process. Then do what? Well, just proceed with the instructions from that point onward, which would mean clean up, clean the roller, put the paint away, take the ladder, store it someplace else, and then stop. So that that's an algorithm that you could tell somebody, you could map that out to have a very simple-minded person go over there and paint that wall. Well, what you see on the screen here is a different sort of a process that's a little more susceptible to having a machine do it. And here, the purpose of this, it's a trivial little arithmetic uh, task. I want you to add up the numbers from 0 to 10. That means 0, and then the next number, which is 0 plus 1, and then the next number, which is 2, and the next number, which is 3. And you want to add these up and tell me as you're adding them up what you're doing, and then what the sum is. So here's a little algorithm in seven steps. Start with the memory cell that is some place that can store this value, zero. Okay, print it out and put a plus sign after it. Then add one to that cell, so the zero becomes a one. And if that value in the memory cell is less than 11, go back to step two, which is printed out followed by a plus sign. And then you add one to it and you come down and do this again. So you're going to go around and around from two through four quite a few times. And every time you do, you're going to print out the contents of the memory cell followed by a plus sign and add one to it. Now, this is not quite right. And here's a little question. What's not right about this? This would not be what is produced by that algorithm. Not quite. There's something that would be here that this algorithm would cause to be printed that isn't represented in this. And I just happened to catch it. So unless you, I don't want to make you think that I had built this in and was so smart that I was going to come up with this. This is just something I saw as I was looking at it now. So I said, oh, let's redefine a deficiency as a feature. So this is a feature can think about how this is not correct. Who knows? That might even be a good question on the exercise. Uh -huh. Well, anyway, once this thing is condition is met, the value in the memory cell is no longer less than 11. It's 11. Well, we've gone too far. Okay. Don't go back. Just continue forward. So print an equal sign, print out the value contained in the memory cell, and stop. And this is pretty much what you would get with one slight mistake, but that is not desirable. But the sum would be correct. It's been added up. So that's an algorithm. That's, that we could write a program to have a machine do. And getting to the point of understanding this was rather momentous. And it only happened around 1936 by a fellow named Alan Turing, this fellow here, who wrote a paper that was mathematical and it, it didn't receive much attention, but it actually mapped this out. And he suggested in his paper, because the technology didn't exist to do this, there were no memory cells laying around, there were no logical circuits or anything else. What he suggested was that a machine that sort of looks like this, but just, it was a thought experiment. He actually saw somebody taking a piece of paper tape and drawing boxes on it, those are the memory cells, and the person would look at one of these memory cells and make a decision based on the rules, 
and then either move the tape right or left to access the next memory cell and maybe erase the contents and replace it with something else, sort of like these instructions. Because if you think about it, when I say add one to the memory cell, it really, if this were a piece of paper tape, it would mean, oh, I'm looking at a number three here. Okay, add one to it makes it four and put the result right there and erase it and put four there. So that's what Turing talked about, a machine that would do that. And its memory was this paper tape that had these things written on it. And the thinking part of it was like a person. It would look at it and see what was there and it would do things based on the rules. And so he showed and he proved, in fact, that you could do anything you could turn into an algorithm, you could now have a machine do, at least in theory. And it only took about 10 years for people to figure out how to use electronic components to actually do this, to have memory that logic circuits could look at instead of having a person look at. Now, that's where that was left, and, and computers actually resulted from this kind of an effort. But I found it really fascinating that this fellow, Mike Davey, I don't know him, but in doing some research on the web, I came across these videos he's put up just recently, like last year. And this actually, he built one of these machines, but it's not as if it's a simple process. He's demonstrating a very simple approach to a computer. But he's done it in a way that uses pretty complex electronics to make this happen. So this is just a minute or two minutes long. I'm going to play this just for the heck of it, and you'll see what this is. Let's see if we can hear him. This is an example of a simple binary counting program. The machine starts with a tape that has 1011 in That is 11 in binary. After the default tape is written, it leads to the right looking for the least significant bit of the number. It then follows two simple rules. If it reads a 1, it changes it to a 0 and moves to the left of the cell. If it reads a 0, it changes it to a 1 and reads again to the right looking for the least significant bit. Now, let me just stop this for a second to explain what he's doing here. He actually built this thing so that it's using a plastic tape. That's like the leader on a uh, motion picture film, so it's white. And he's got some machine here with an erasable marker and a little roller that rolls around and when it drops down it can erase things. And over here, he's got a little bit of a camera that scans across so it actually reads what's in this cell. So he's replicated here in electronics and mechanical stuff just exactly what Turing said. Here's this thing that can, rep it can read what's written here. It can erase it. It can rewrite it. But the circuitry to do this is very complicated. In fact, that same circuitry could build a computer and do this whole thing much better. But his purpose here was to show exactly what Turing had in mind and just to have automated the process. So what will happen here is this thing is taking a binary value 11 and it's adding up, sort of similar to what I wrote here, it's adding up, adding 1 to it and making it count from 11, 12, 13, all the way up to 16. And now he speeds it up because it's kind of tedious to see the thing work. But that's what Turing had in mind. That's what he envisioned. Not this particular machine, but a person doing this, and not this way of implementing. The program falls when it finds a blank cell to the left of the cell it just wrote a zero in. It then writes a one, and the program stops. And so that one followed by four zeros in binary is the value 16 in decimal. So I thought that was an interesting way, it's better than words, to show you what Turing had in mind. And that's about as far as we have to go. It's just a historical point in time that Turing, in defining that, just on the, the verge of the era when electronics would be able to make it possible, is what led into the 1940s in this experimentation. Now, I'm not going to play this one, but if you were interested in the mechanics of how he did this, this, this is the video that does it. Now he explains all the different components he used to build this machine. If you've got an engineering mentality, you might want to look into that, but that's, that's not really our instructional purposes here. So it's just this one that you'd want to have taken a look at. Anyway, you could read through that, and it will be written up as a page in the reading materials too, but I just found it was handy to put it here since this is kind of freestanding. So remember what an algorithm is. That's kind of important. And eventually, later on in the course, when we get to just exploring a little bit of computer programming, we'll do this. We'll, I might even give you a little assignment to come up with an algorithm that does something. 
not to write the program, because the program actually, once the algorithm is defined and it's sort of tested out by hand, we know that a program can be written to do that. It won't be your job in this course to write that program unless you actually wanted to explore that. So anyway, that's where that thing comes from. Now, what we're going to do is take a look for the moment at some projects here, and then I'm going to talk about geoprocessing, which is what one of the projects deals with. So here, let me show you what's available for you right now. Three of these projects have actually been put up there, and this one will be up there very soon. So I don't know if you've had a chance to take a look at this or not. Let me just run through them quickly. This timeline has a bunch of hyperlinks in it that you could take a look at. Basically what you're coming up with here is 10 slides that you make up into decade by decade through the 1900s. Some information, hopefully a picture or two, of something that occurred in that decade that led to, to the present time in terms of computers. And obviously I've just given you one thing now with the 1930s with uh, Turing's machine and his paper. So a picture of Turing and a little dis description would be what would go on that page. So there are 10 slides plus a cover slide and you just turn in the slides to me. That's what the product of this particular assignment is if you want to do that one. The second one, I'll be showing you, and in fact I made the video already and I thought I had put it up, but I guess I didn't. I'll be showing you how to use PowerPoint as an easel to put pictures into and resize them and then once you've arranged things with some text and the pictures to just get one digital image of the entire screen. Now this is kind of handy to do. If you don't know much about video, about the digital picture editing, you don't really have to and you don't have to go on out and learn any kind of a new tool or buy any software to do this. If you have PowerPoint, you're already well set for it. And what happens many times is, you know, you might take a picture with a digital camera Digital cameras shoot very high resolution these days, multi-megapixels. That means the picture that you just took, if you looked at it on a computer, it would be poster size. You're going to see a little piece of it if you tool around. And it's big. And if you attach one or two of these to an email, it's probably going to clog up somebody's inbox because it's just too big. So how do you make it smaller? Well, you know, some email programs do that for you automatically. But it turns out, if you wanted to, let's say, well, my mother's 88. She came to visit over Thanksgiving. I wanted to send her a little something in the way of a picture that encapsulate a lot of what happens. We, we took a few pictures. Okay, I'd like to get them all on one page and put a little something there saying mom's visit 2010 and give her one picture. Well, you can do that with PowerPoint. You just include the pictures and grab them by the corner and resize them, arrange them the way you want, make the background whatever color you want, put in whatever text you want. And then I show you in this little write-up all you have to do to get one JPEG out that's a reasonable size. And you can attach that to an email and send it. Well, look at that. It's everything in one. It's not all this disconnected bunch of multi-megapixel things that people have trouble downloading. So that's what the output of this is. And I'll have that assignment documented fairly quickly. Now here is another assignment that I figured some people might like. What I'd like you to do in this case is explore ten different ways of sharing information. This is all computer-based communication. So you're familiar with email. You may be familiar with IMs, you know, that would do text messaging, some might do Twitter, you might be using something like Delicious to share website uh, addresses, and then social networking of various types. But sound files, still images, slide sets, video, all these different ways of sharing information. You don't have to actually do any of this. This whole thing is simply to get you thinking about and looking up what these things are about for the ones that you may not be familiar with and then building a little chart where you answer a few questions for me about, uh, let's see here, well there's a chart that goes with this in fact, so let's do this, and save this, this is one of those RTFs again, so here you'll complete this chart And each of these different, these ten different types of communication mediated by a computer, a little description of it, what's the best purpose of it, how do you use it? This is you individually, and if you don't use this thing, you just say, I don't use it. But then how do you think you might use it on the job with whatever career you're thinking that you might pursue? 
well, an easy one here, email practically every occupation, unless it's like these guys building this building across the street, practically every occupation, the communication occurs with email these days, and maybe some other forms as well. But at least with this. So this is just filling out each one of these cells, but here's the wrinkle. You can't put more than 40 words in any one of these cells. So you have to make sure that what you write is concise. And the reason I say that is, I don't want you just copying something from Wikipedia, all this stuff, and dumping it in there. Well, the answer's in there somewhere. No, 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 no. It's got to tell you as much, tell me as much as it needs to, but no more than 40 words. So you have to, you have to package this and make the writing concise. And then, of course, some of these you're more familiar with than others. So this requires you to do a little bit of thinking, but basically I've done the work of laying this out. So then if you do the research on these types of communication that you're not familiar with, you should have an easy time filling some of this out. And the stuff that's individual to you is, of course, individual to you. So let's take a look. That's a possibility. Now, here's an interesting one. This is coming soon. I haven't made up my mind what I'm going to put out there, and it's getting kind of late to do that but I will definitely have that up by the end of the day as well. Here's one that I think you're going to find kind of interesting. And this gets into the issue of geoprocessing, which I'm going to be talking about in just a little bit. In fact, this is the way we can introduce the topic. Now, geoprocessing, it's the combination of data that we might, we might have collected already related to geography, but not displayed in a way that makes sense on a map. For example, the census that occurred last year. You undoubtedly or somebody in your household got a form and had to answer some simple questions about you know, uh, ethnicity and, and uh, perhaps the ages of people in the house and how many people live there and other things. Some people had to answer a more detailed survey than others. But basically, this is all just information that gets dumped into a computer and it's all a bunch of facts. Well. How do you make any sense of this? There are geographical units called census tracts, and they're laid out to have two to 4,000 households within them. And the data is spit back by the government based on this. They give a whole bunch of information about the nature of the people who live in the census tract. So there are thousands of these all over a major city and all over the country. But supposing you really wanted to see this in a way that was graphic, you wanted to see a map and you want to see it shaded, let's see maybe all the areas where people make a lot of money or different colors for different income levels. So you could look at a map and see where the rich areas were and where the poor areas were. Or maybe another way, you've collected information, not census data, but you've collected information on the occurrence of serious crimes, you know, crimes against property or crimes against people's bodies. And so this exists in tabulated form, but you want to see it against a map. And maybe you want to combine that with information that the government has collected about the kind of people who live in that area. So are these crimes occurring in areas where there's high income or low income or other demographic factors? Well, this is called geoprocessing, where you are going to use a computer to combine tabular information about things with geography. And it's got a history of around 40 years behind it. The Census Bureau was very interested in this because it wanted to automate the process of collecting the data. And in order to do that, it had to be able to draw maps out of a computer. So that meant digitizing things. What they did originally was actually to get maps and then digitize the intersections so that they could make a line drawing map out of the computer. And then they had to store information about the street names and all that, and that longitude and latitude and just trying to get them pinned down. And that went through a couple of iterations, and eventually they put out a program here that I had a little something, uh, we had some use of this many, many years ago. This program was provided free to take addressed information and match it up to geography. But it's rather crude because it's very early in the day. Well, I just included two maps here that actually came from uh, what's done these days with geoprocessing. These are both satellite photos that are uh, part of the vast amount of stuff that Google Earth puts out. And I just wanted to compare here an old area. This is London. And you can see that the street pattern is really strange because it grew up over the last thousand years. 
Some of these are probably footpaths that people followed a thousand years ago, and maybe whatever the land contours were at the time, why somebody curved it this way or that, maybe somebody claimed this piece of property and there was a tree there or something, and so their line went this way and that. So this area is more complex to try and figure things out than an area that's recently developed like Phoenix, Arizona. The engineers that went out there just laid out a grid of streets. It was all desert. Nobody there, so they made it very regular, and it's just a different street pattern to it. But these pictures were both shot from a satellite, you know, thousands of miles up there in the air, and with very high-resolution cameras. The government does this now, and it's public information. So Google latched onto it, and if you've never played with Google Earth, it's really kind of interesting. But you can visit any place on Earth just by putting the, the words in there that describe it, and I'll show you in a second how Google actually gets you there. So this particular project is just to get you familiar with that. There's two videos that I put out here that you look at first, and then you pick out some famous place on Earth that you want to go to. The result of this is a movie that you make and you put up on YouTube. How are you going to make a movie? Well, do you have a camera? If you have a digital camera with movie mode, you hold it up here like I did to make the first of these, and you take these actions and talk about them, and the camera's running, and so it's a little fuzzy, but so what? You know, we get the drift of what you're doing on the screen. And then I made a second one, because I had gotten an eye touch that has one of the more current ones, the fourth generation, has a camera in it. And then I held that over here just to compare how that one would look. So here's an explanation of what's going on with this assignment. <laughs> this one, I could have just put a little music in it. You tuned into Google Earth, and I've got a digital camera facing the screen in order to record what I'm doing, and I'm just talking. Now, I don't usually put music on these because it clutters things up, but I was drinking a little sangria that night, so I thought for the good one. In order to complete this project. Now, we're going to focus on some place to take a look and take a short tour. So what I'm going to do, I put here uh, where I think now, let's move this around to about the center, and I think that's probably Paris, France. And I'm going to go down a little farther, and let's just hone in a little bit farther. Well, I'm going to do that. Let's hone in a little bit farther and see if we can come up with something. Now, let's turn on the identification here, borders and labels. Okay, well, let's see what that does. That was not France, that was Spain. Ah. All right, let's go up to see France. Here we go. And let's see if we can figure out where Paris is. Ah, here we are, Paris. Okay, now let's take that position. Now, Google doesn't supply the music. That would be so much of it. Or, if you want to take a tour, just a brief tour, of something that's recognizable here in Paris. Where is the Eiffel Tower? Well, an easier way to find it would be just to go Y2, and I have to figure out how it's spelled. Oops, it's correct. All right, so now it's going to fly directly to the Eiffel Tower. Aha! Okay, so I can go closer by rolling the mouse wheel here. That goes, I'm looking down on top of it. That's probably it right there. But now, if I want to go to street level, I have to look for one of these pictures, one of these cameras here, and let's see if we can get down to street level. Come on now. This place right there, and it's heading right into it, so that we can go down this way. And now we're on the street, and we can take a look at what the Eiffel Tower looks like. Step back from it. This is a 360 degree photo. Oh, looks like I went the wrong way there. I don't know what to do better than I'm doing right now because now I'm sort of flying over the territory here. What I really want to do is get back to this view that shows me ground level. So, what I'm asking you to do in this little project, should you choose to do this one, is something like this to go visit some place of note that is 
someplace in the world that maybe you've never been, but you'd like to be, or someplace that you have been and you want to show it to us, or just someplace famous that you maybe never thought of, but it would be an interesting thing to do, someplace in the world where we can recognize where you're at, and you make a little three to five minute video of this using whatever digital camera or cell phone camera that you might be able to use, and then figure out how to put this up on YouTube as an unlisted video so that you can share it with us, but not everybody else in the world can see it. Or put it out there as a public video if you wish. Either way, send me the URL, and that's how I'll grade this thing. And then, let's see, at the end of it, why don't you have Google Earth fly you home? So I'm going to put Chicago, Illinois, USA here, and let's just see if Google Earth can fly me back home. And here we go, and we're coming down to Chicago, and if I get closer, I can probably home right in on the Paul University. Uh, let's just see where, oh, there's the river, let's go up here, let's see if we can find Lincoln Park somewhere in this neighborhood. I'm sure you would find DePaul University probably right here, if I'm not mistaken, but in any case, you can figure that much out, okay? So there's one of your potential projects for Unit 2, exploring some very new uses of computers in the area of geographic processing. So, I was originally just going to put that out there as the assignment, but then I did a little survey and most people responded saying, well, we really could use the write-up too, so then we got the write-up, and the write-up, let's get back to the write-up now, write-up, here, this is the page that describes, and you want to read this before you go doing this, but then you know, the assignment itself, oh, sorry, the assignment itself is here, and when you do this, you get this write-up on it that describes what you need to do. Now the second link here, I'm not going to go all the way through this one. But this one's a little different. I didn't bother putting the music on this. I don't know if I in the future. It's just that here I was holding the camera before I had a different camera, the tripod. And this one gives me the ability, since I was holding it, I could move it around and show you on the screen things like here. I was entering various things here. And in this case, I went to Rome and took a look at an interesting building there. So, just to give you a variety of things that you might consider doing, that's another project that you could be working on. And I will put up the fourth project to give you more choice, but if any of these, and I'll put this one up as well. So, these four that will be up there very quickly, you can certainly choose from them if you want to make some progress. Now, I'll be putting up the rest of the pages in conjunction with the lecture that occurs on Thursday. And by the end of the week, I'll have the exercise up there based on these readings. So if you have any questions related to this, I could answer them at this time. And since the people out there don't have any idea how many people are in the room at this time, there's this vast sea of people here. There's standing room only, in fact, in this room. People have just cluttered in here. Actually, I'm flying. There's only three people in the room right now. And so when I ask for questions, I may not actually get any. I'm waiting for the day when nobody shows up to the class and I still have to talk into the camera to give the lecture. <laughs> I think I'll put some balloons here with faces going on and just to look like we have somebody attending. Okay, so, how are you guys doing? How are the, uh, the project, uh, what's the progress on the exercises? Oh, just doing the reading as it comes along a bit and then uh, just looking at them. 
Okay. Well, it's too bad that I got a little bit delayed last week on the exercise of number two because this one, of course, would be more to work on, but they are open all throughout the term. And as far as these other things go, these projects, I'll give you more time on them since I'm kind of delayed at getting them up here. It's not as if they're due this Sunday in a very rigid way. But the, uh, what I'm doing more and more of now is giving you links within the readings to pursue additional things if you're interested in those subjects. And part of what we're going to be doing with the projects is actually looking at careers that exist in all of these different fields and what the requirements for those are. That's one reason I'm a little bit held up on this other, this other uh, project because I'm trying to come up with a way of doing that in a way that is kind of interesting for people. The uh, intent of this course is actually to expose you to a variety of things about computing in the modern world and also to take a look at what you might think about doing to prepare yourself for work in one of these areas if you were kind of interested in that. So what you might do, if you wanted to just explore that already, let me point out something here that suggests itself. When you go through this page, C4E.us, you also have access here to a course that I teach in the internship area uh, for juniors in computer science. And when you look in here, there are some things that relate to the workplace that you might find handy no matter what kind of a thing you're eventually interested in. Now, one reason I put these materials up on the web and I don't hide them in the system is I think some of these things are of interest to students even if they don't take that particular course. Or it might be that they're kind of curious about some of these things and would like to pursue this even before they took a course to sort of have a head start on it. So the hyperlinks in here lead to articles and such that might be of interest to you if you have a little free time and you wanted to explore them. I just thought I'd point that out to you. This is another course that I teach that has to do with a little bit of art history and things and technology, but I'm not trying to market it. I just thought I'd mention what's going on here. So be looking fairly soon back at this site for here the additional readings, and I would suggest down here, if you folks who have actually come to the class, this would be just a repeat of what you heard the other day, the one that is going to be captured, it's being captured right now, and I'll process it will appear here, and then Thursdays will appear here also. One of the reasons I'm saying this is for people who only see this thing online, uh, I just want to give an explanation of what's going on there. I will package these things up outside of the course online system so that you can access them here. And it turns out, I guess I've put up enough videos on YouTube and they've had enough people watching them that I think when you go over 10,000 views on something, they say, okay, you can put up longer videos than 10 minutes. So that's why this particular video, if you look at it, you'll see that it actually it far exceeds the 10 minute limit they usually impose on these videos being uploaded. So. I felt kind of gratified by that. Uh, interestingly enough, the video that put me over the 10,000 was one on Russia's nuclear explosion in 1961 of some big H-bomb, 57 megatons, and I just did it as kind of a lark pulling it off the web and then matching sound to it in an artificial way. I took the sound from some other nuke explosion and made the sound appear when the flash appeared, which is not the way you normally see it these films because the camera is so far away it doesn't get the sound right away. And apparently there are a lot of people out there who like to look at fireworks because more than 10,000 people have viewed that in the nine or ten months that it's been up there. And so I can put up these lectures now that uh, are longer than ten minutes. I don't have to break them up into pieces. So anyway, this will make these lectures more accessible, but it is my goal to eventually replace these kinds of things with little lectures made for the purpose and edited more than then uh, these things give me the ability to do. So what's coming up down the pike, uh, after this unit, we start taking a look at what I call more contemporary uses of computers, where actually we're going to talk about sound editing and uh, digital picture editing and video editing. So on your own computers, you probably have the software to do this already. Some people have PCs and we have Windows Movie Maker on that. And in the Mac environment, iMovie or something similar, 
people that should do some of that work. The sound editor for both environments is free software, and I'll be putting up some videos that show you how to load that up. And the photo editing software is actually out on the web. Picasa does it and some other products too that are web-based. So that you'll be able to explore all of these kinds of things. And then after that comes a little bit of internet exposure where you're going to be able to program some simple stuff on the internet and test it out with your browser. And in the last two weeks, we're going to cover a little bit more about algorithms and some types of programming that you might have access to already. And I'll have some pointers at that time for how you could actually, if you were interested in computer programming, kind of learn some of it on your own with some web resources before you took a programming class so that you were better prepared for a programming class. I have found that our 10-week terms are pretty short for people who attempt programming and haven't had any background in it. It's a similar experience I had at Northwestern. They have 10-week terms, and I only succeeded in programming in that first term because I had already taken at least part of a course in junior college by that time. But people who hit programming for the first time in the 10 weeks, the 10 weeks wasn't enough for them to learn it. And so it's particularly unfortunate for people to come into our initial Java programming class without having had any prior contact with it because it's really tough to have it sit in your mind and make any sense that fast. Some people can do it, but it's really a handicap not to have had some prior experience. So that's why I point you in the direction of some resources that would give you that prior experience if you wanted to do that on your own before taking a regular programming class. Well, I would like to encourage the people who only do this online to email me or call me at the number that's on the website, and I'll be happy to chat with you.